Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. So good evening, everyone. I'd like to formally welcome you to our Summer B Public Debate Exhibition. As you might have already heard, uh, my name is Ben Scarpino and I'm the president of the speech and debate team here at UF. And before we begin um, tonight's debate, I wanted to take a quick moment to talk a little bit about this team and what it is that we do um, at the university. Um, fundamentally, the speech and debate team is an educational organization devoted to fostering those arts of communication and persuasion within our membership. We seek to develop those skills that will allow us to effectively, clearly, and comfortably convey our ideas to an audience, whether that be just a few individuals or to a larger public speaking forum. And while the team is subdivided into three different groups that I'll go into in just a minute, we are united um, in this goal of fostering those skills of communication. So first we have our speech squad, which competes in individual events in a variety of different formats, presenting both pre-prepared and extemporaneous speeches. There are even categories where our competitors provide theatrical and dramatic interpretations of poetry and prose. Next, we have our competitive debate division, which competes in both individual and team competitions with other colleges, exploring a variety of different resolutions and topics from politics and current events to pop culture and ethics. And finally, we have our public debate team, which is on exhibition tonight. And this is a team in which squad members organize and compete within debates among themselves. And this gives them the unique opportunity to find resolutions that are pertinent to our times, but also important to them, and that to present them to a larger audience in the hopes that they will share with you a new perspective and new ideas that you might not have considered before. So of course, if any of this interests you, or if you are interested by what you see tonight, I will post a link to our website in the chat and feel free to reach out to me directly at any time tonight. Um, but without further ado, I'd like to get started. So I'm going to introduce our fantastic captain of our public debate squad and tonight's moderator, Holly Smith. Thank you, Ben. Uh, as he just said, my name is Holly Smith. I am the public debate captain for this upcoming year. And I'm just gonna introduce uh, tonight's debate to you. First, welcome. Uh, thank you for coming to our debate. As you can see here, the resolution for tonight's debate is bright futures should be uh, expanded to cover the full cost of college. Now, for those of you who may be unfamiliar with the structure of public debates, I'm just gonna go over that very quickly. Uh, we have a resolution, as I just uh, showed to you. Uh, the resolution is defined as the proposition that is subject to debate or the statement that we are debating tonight. There are two teams in this style of debate. The affirmation is the team that argues in support of the resolution, and the negation is the team that negates the resolution. Each team has two different types of speeches. Uh, normally, there would be three, but we had four debaters tonight, so we combined the introductory introduction speech and constructive speech into one. These speeches uh, lay out all the points for that team's position. There's typically three arguments for each position or each team. And then there is the rebuttal speech, which critiques the opposing team's arguments. Uh, as you can see, I made a little diagram here to um, show you the structure. So there is a total of four speeches tonight. I have a couple of quick reminders for each of you before we get started. Firstly, this debate is recorded. Uh, we want to keep the focus on those who are speaking, so with that in mind, please keep your cameras off, your microphones muted, your hands and feet inside the riot at all times, etc. Um, please do not message the debaters during the debate. Uh, at the end of the debate, there will be an audience poll, and we encourage guests who are not judging or debating to stick around and vote. Uh, fourthly, the debaters may be arguing points they don't believe in. What they're doing tonight is a demonstration of analytical writing and performance and argumentation rather than a reflection of personal beliefs. So please keep that in mind. Um, once the debaters finish speaking, I will give judges five minutes to private message me their decisions, whether they believe the affirmation or negation won the debate. Uh, after the outcome is announced, I will ask each of you to elaborate on your decisions. So please be prepared to do so. And finally, for those who are here for class credit, I will be sending out a link to a Google form to take attendance at the end of the debate. So with all that out of the way, uh, I will introduce the debaters. We have some national treasures here tonight. On the affirmation, we have Sophia Rapazzo and Hunter Hurley. On the negation, we have Jeffrey Tassinelli and Serrano Davis. Serrano Davis couldn't join us tonight. He's not feeling very well. So I will be delivering his 
negation rebuttal in his absence. But with all that out of the way, I will leave it to the debaters. Once again, thank you all for coming and I hope you enjoy. Good evening. My name is Sophia Rapazzo and I will be arguing with my team member Hunter in affirmation of the resolution that Bright Future should be expanded to cover the full cost of college. We believe that the current outdated merit-based tiers should be abolished so that all students who would currently qualify for at least the lowest tier, which only covers 75% of necessary costs, should be afforded free tuition and no additional cost by the university. We argue that students should not have to incur any expenses for housing or course-related fees, including textbooks. These additional costs are often more burdensome than tuition itself and undercut the spirit of the Bright Future Scholarship and can prevent some students from attending college and receiving their degrees. As a result, the ones most needy will suffer the greatest, and this will perpetuate social injustices and inequalities. Our argument is based on three points. First, we argue that by expanding Bright Futures, there's a greater incentive for students to attend college if costs are paid for by the state. Next, we eliminate bias against low-income students who pay more for the same education. And finally, an expansion of Bright Futures would help minimize student debt. Our first point is that expanding Bright Futures incentivizes more students to obtain a college education and break the downward mobility that many Americans suffer from today. Attending university has become increasingly impossible for many students. For instance, from 2008 to 2018, the average cost of a degree from a four-year public university increased by 40% and by 25% for private schools. If Bright Futures covered all college-related expenses for all students who received the scholarship, it is likely that 26% more students would enroll into college, according to Forbes. The Florida Access Network highlights that 70.2% of non-low-income students finish a year of college credit in two years, whereas only 57.8% of low-income students can do the same. This equity gap would shrink with a fully funded Bright Future scholarship that can truly provide all students with a bright future and eliminate ancillary costs such as health insurance premiums that prevent low-income students from attending classes. Covering the full cost of college to all Bright Future scholarship recipients allows some of the poorest students to attend college when it would be impossible for them to attend otherwise, even if there were some scholarship assistance. Our second point is that altering Bright Futures by covering the full cost of college, starting at the current lowest tier of the scholarship, would intentionally not be disparate and actively work against existing disparities between low and high income students. Students from wealthy families occupy the highest tiers because they have more resources available to them. Those who have the greatest means receive the most benefits. Conversely, lower income students statistically make up the highest proportion of the lowest qualifying tier, and yet they are the ones who are having to pay some for their college education. Essentially, low-income students disproportionately pay more for college with the current Bright Future structure. Out of all low-income households making under $25,000 per year, only 21% of high school graduates qualified for Bright Future's lowest tier, and over 50% of high school graduate households making $75,000 qualified for the highest tier. These statistics demonstrate how higher income students are systematically rewarded and lower income students are systematically punished. To combat this unfair reality, Bright Futures must be expanded to complete what it is in theory supposed to do, assist all students in paving the way toward a bright future. Finally, we argue that expanding Bright Futures would help minimize student debt. It would provide more students with the education needed to obtain jobs without the morally wrong crippling debt that comes with it. For instance, on average, students in Florida with school-related debt owe an average of $35,496, according to Lending Trust. Florida ranks as the 10th highest state for student debt. Auxiliary costs associated with attending college, such as application fees, housing deposit fees, health insurance fees and other costs are impossible for someone with a minimum wage job to incur. For example, a single housing application fee is roughly three and a half hours of work or almost 40% of a single workday. Student debt disproportionately affects minorities so much that the Department of Education reports that after 12 years of beginning university, African American students on average made no progress on debt repayment. Instead, they owed more than they borrowed. After 12 years of incessant payment, students were only losing money. 
This is just another aspect of how low income and minority students are systematically set up to lead more debt filled and disadvantaged lives compared to their higher income or white peers. In some offering free education to more students is necessary to both increase their opportunities and to make for a progressive and equitable society. A more educated society will be in a better position to solve problems when we encounter them as a nation or international community at large. We, the affirmation, strongly believe that bright futures must be expanded to cover the full cost of college. We must incentivize students to attend college by covering its cost. It would be a disservice to society and unethical to keep the bright future scholarship underfunded and skewed to aid students who already have sufficient financial means. The support and resources to increase their standardized test scores, participate in community service, and achieve the highest grades. We must make a college education more accessible, value education as a, as a society, and eliminate monetary stresses from the lives of students so that they can focus on school. These changes keep the spirit of bright futures because qualification is based not on financial need, but on academic merit. Thank you.